We certainly live in a time in the United States where we have amazing freedom to pick and choose what we believe and what we don't believe from a spiritual or religious or faith tradition perspective. There's much less cultural pressure than, say, the 50s and 60s to conform to the religious tradition that we have been a part of and our family has been a part of. And I will say that there's a part of that freedom that I think is great. For if we are to come to a faith or be in a tradition, it is not because of outside forces or unhealthy pressures. It's because we choose to be a part of that tradition. But I would say the danger in this moment is within that freedom, it may be that we haven't received from parents or grandparents or invested the time in our, ourselves into our tradition to really know the baseline framework of our faith. So then as we engage other religions or other traditions or meditative thoughts, that we, we may not have that baseline framework to know how to bounce off those other traditions off our very own. And that's okay. It's nothing to feel guilty about. But what I might call you to is to think about where am I with this? What do I know about my Protestant Reformed Christian faith if this is the tradition you are regularly in? And how does that inform or not inform what I engage in out in the world, whether it be other religions or other Christians, tr- Christian traditions or otherwise? And so I say all that as an introduction to a sermon series that I'm really going to engage in for the rest of the summer. And I hope to give you a framework, this framework that we operate within. And it it's informed by a a theologian, Daniel Migliori, who I had in seminary. And I often return to his book entitled Faith Seeking Understanding. And here are some of the themes that we will hit on over the next couple of months. How does God reveal God's self in the world? Does Scripture still have authority? Why does God have three parts or three persons? Is creation good? How hands-on is God's care for us and for creation And what do we do with evil in the world? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? What does the person and work of Jesus Christ have to do with us? How does the Holy Spirit impact my faith? Does community matter? And what is my Christian hope? But today, I want to start with our inquiry. Why are we here? What got you out of bed this morning and got you here in worship? What are you looking for? Aside from worshiping God, what is the hunger you have that has brought you to this place? Well, about 20 years ago, Katie and I were doing youth ministry in Northern Ireland And uh, we didn't have church vans back then, so if we were going to go places with the kids, often we'd drive with uh, the or ride with the seniors in that youth group. And Colin and Martin were twins in this youth group, and they drove a 90-something blue Escort. And I'm here to say that the defroster in that car did not work at all. And uh, Colin and Martin, one of them was driving, the other was always riding shotgun, and they had two sponges. And they were constantly wiping the windshields of the car. And Katie and I were white-knuckled in the back seat of that car, just praying and hoping we'd get to wherever we were going safely and that they could somehow drive and laugh and talk and still see the road in front of them. It's a lot like hotel, hotel mirrors, don't you think? You know, you get out of the shower and a lot of hotels don't have blowers in the bathroom and the mirror 
is all steamed up and you keep wiping it with your hand, then you wipe it with towels and that still doesn't work. And I don't know about you, then I start slinging water on it. And that still doesn't work. And, you know, I'm trying to shave and there's about this much of the mirror that I'm looking into to see whether I'm cutting off my goatee or not. I think in faith, we need to keep wiping the steamy mirror. Don't you think? Well, Paul touches on this with the young Christians that he is working with in Corinth. And I'm here to tell you they were a gifted bunch of young church members. I mean, gifted in wonderful ways. But Paul was trying to to refocus them. And he kept saying, hey folks, you don't see everything right now. And he has that wonderful line, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. In other words, in our life we get glimpses of the beauty of God, but that's what they are. They're glimpses. And at least in this present makeup of creation, in this incompleteness, you're not going to see the whole thing. Even in your great giftedness, you're not going to see everything. The completeness of God one day will be face to face. In faith, don't we need to keep cleaning that steamy window to try to see a little bit better even though we can't see the whole thing? I think there's some of us when it comes to our religion or our faith or our spirituality that we either view it as a problem or a mystery. And so let me, let me deal with those of us who, who when we look at our, our faith, we view it as a problem that we have, that we need to look into. And what do we do with problems? Well, we try to solve them. At least a lot of men, that's the first thing they do when they see a problem, is they try to solve it. And once we get to the conclusion of the problem, what do we do? We move on to the next problem to solve it. But the problem with solving problems is we think that's the end of it. And we've just learned from Paul that there's no end to solving the problem of God. At least until God decides it's the end time. And so I really prefer... For us to look at the faith as a mystery. A mystery that is inexhaustible. A mystery where we get glimpses of who God is. And it's so beautiful, we, we want to keep wiping off the mirror to see more. Because we realize it, it has something impacting to do with our life. And so we keep wiping Because we want more. Because it makes a difference. The mystery is inexhaustible. So we keep digging. We keep trying to wipe away what's blocking us. Well, Paul uh, helps us out a little bit more with this. I don't know if you noticed, but in in verse 8, he talks about love. It's the end of that great section describing love, but the beginning of our section, it says, love never ends. And at the end of our section, he says, and now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is what? Love. That's right. And have we ever tried to really define love? I've never seen, you know, I've seen occasional good descriptions or definitions, but they're always limited. It's always a part of it. You know, we we grow up and we want parental love and affirmation. If we've got siblings or good friends, we, we have brotherly and sisterly love. We've got infatuation, which may be a part of love when we're Fallen in love as teenagers and we just can't get enough of the love that we have for somebody. We just can't touch it enough. We've got 
maybe a little bit more mature, romantic love. There's selfless love or, or love that's based in hard work and action and commitment. I mean, all these things describe love, but they don't get at the mystery of what love really is. And Paul helps us with this. He says in here that the core of who God is, is love. But again, we're always at that mirror trying to wipe away. We can't get at the core of really all that love is because right now we only see who God is dimly. And you might ask, why should I keep wrestling with my faith? Why should I keep showing up here on Sunday morning? Why should I keep wiping that steamy mirror? And I would suggest a posture of humility. Because if we're really honest with ourselves, we don't sit on the throne of this life. We didn't create all There is, but we've been privileged to have breath and have life and to be here in this time and place. And and even though you may have had a hard life, well, I bet at some moments of life you have received unconditional love and it felt great. And I bet you've had moments where you've given unconditional love and you've thought, this feels right. This feels what it's about. And so if God is love, and God is the author of love, and that's what's poured into creation and into our lives, then If there's any truth in that at all, then we should keep wiping that mirror. Keep trying to see who God is, even though there are days where we can only see it dimly, because we know in that little place that we can see that there is truth. And that there is the source of something larger than ourselves. I love uh, the Scripture that we started with in our call to worship today. One of the fathers of, of Israel, Jacob, he's moving his family, and they've crossed the river, and he's alone one night. He stayed on the other side of the river. And all of a sudden, someone appeared. It's hard to get real clarity on who it is in our Scripture. It may be God in the flesh appearing in the Old Testament. It could be an angel of God, but it is a divine figure, whoever it is. And Jacob and that figure start wrestling. And they wrestle all night. It is a good match. And eventually, this divine figure touches the hip of Jacob. But Jacob still won't let go. And he says, bless me. And Jacob continues to hold on and fight. And eventually, this divine figure says it's almost dawn. And eventually, Jacob gets that blessing. And the dawn comes. And he realizes he has had a moment with God. And I think that's the image we're called to. We're called to hang on, to, to hang on to God, to keep wrestling, to keep look for that blessing, to keep look, looking for that source of life because we know that's where the source is. And even though we don't know exactly who it is, we know the one we're wrestling with is of God. So friends, keep, keep wiping that mirror. Keep looking for little spaces where we can get glimpses of God. Because I get here, I get up here every Sunday. And you show up every Sunday because we know that that is the source of hope and life larger than ourselves. Amen.